where in a million years have you ever in the history of, of, of the COMEX or the CME seen a margin reduction into a price rise? I mean, that's ludicrous. They now have to keep printing all these branches. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Welcome to Live from the Vault. My name is Shane Morand, and I'll be your host for this episode. And from the entire Live from the Vault team worldwide, we want to thank you for your continued support. And as you can imagine, the community keeps growing more and more every single week, and we thank you so much. There's a lot to talk about during these historic times, and Andrew McGuire is in the house, and we'll be talking gold in just a minute here. This is going to be an amazing episode, so fasten your seatbelts. You know, Live from the Vault gives you access to information and updates that you just can't get anywhere else. And this episode is going to be no exception. So just before we get to Talking Gold with Andrew McGuire, remember to please keep spreading the word about this channel by hitting that like button, uh, sharing this information, and hit the smash button. You can subscribe right there by hitting that uh, subscribe button too. Uh, this is really going to help us reach even more and more people during these historic times and then, while you're at it, just click on that little bell there if you'd like to be notified as each episode goes live. So hit the button right now. And with that, let's head over to the UK and talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Now, Andrew, as usual, let's start off with a review of what you're seeing in the ongoing paper to physical uh, war, I guess we would call it now. And this was a long, long before the Russia conflict uh, began. And to answer a huge amount of requests that we're getting, can you first start off by picking up on the thread that we had uh, two weeks ago? Yeah, great to see you, Shane, and uh, great to be with everybody. Uh, I, I really think it's so important that we take this look at, um, at this different look at the market. And, um, and obviously, we'll really try and bring you up to speed because a lot of stuff going on. And um, but you you mentioned the war. Well, I mean, there is an officially driven PSYOP war on gold. And uh, we looked at the PSYOPs and obviously I know most people know what PSYOPs is. It's a legitimate thing. It's a tactic um, and it is usually a war tactic. Um, but obviously you look on Wikipedia and you'll, you'll see a really good, decent idea of what it is. But this PSYOP war on gold, it really ramped up this last couple of weeks, actually. And this drove the divergence between paper gold and physical gold to the extremes actually not seen since March 2020. And our focus has been on the backwardated EFPs. Now, look, you know, we talked about backwardation. Backwardation is simple. It is simply when you have a futures price that is uh, that is actually lower than the spot price i.e so that should not happen and that happens only in a case of when it's oversold and efps are the exchange for physical mechanisms which we've described many many times which essentially is the comex price then transiting over to the spot markets in the in the in london and the globe now what we're saying is is this is where our focus is because it's the Achilles heel and they're da it's dangerously close again since March 2020, the first time since March 2020, where it's driving out liquidity providers. And once again, these providers are very, very concerned that they're going to get caught holding the bag in a March 2020 EFP blow up. Now, Andrew, we've had a lot of incoming questions about the current paper market volatility. It's uh, up and down like a yo-yo. We just had mentioned this, too. Can you just tell us what you think is going on in not only the short term, but the medium and also the long term here? Yeah, really important, um, especially when you've got this kind of level of volatility, which is designed to provide volatility. In fact, the COMEX was initially 50 years ago designed to import volatility and also dilution. So um, there's no other reason for this market to be operating the way it is. A legitimate uh, futures market is a necess necessary item. If you're a corn, uh, if, you're, if you grow corn and you need to know what your pricing is at the end of the year, it's legitimate to be hedging it. It's a useful instrument. But 
when you start to play games with uh, futures contracts, it's no longer a legitimate instrument. And so let's step back. I think it's always best to step back for a millisecond to look at what we just described, this March 2020 event. It's so because it's so highly relevant now. And obviously we looked at it, goodness me, in an earlier episode back in March 2020. We looked in detail as in live time, what was happening and over the months, how that played out. But this was essentially when liquidity providers, which is uh, these, these are these are the liquidity providers who are long spot gold, not in the COMEX, but long spot gold on behalf of clients. Now, what that is, is a foreign exchange cross between gold and the dollar. So you're either if you're if you're long gold, you're short the dollar. And if you're long the dollar, you're short gold. But in this case, we're talking about um, speculators who come in to buy spot gold for various reasons, and maybe to speculate on, on a higher price because it seems cheap. But so essentially, um, so when a liquidity provider purchases this on behalf of a client, they were able, when providing these longs to speculators and traders, to get away with trusting the short COMEX futures market, which are, again are unbacked. So you've got unbacked and unbacked. Uh, and so these are paper hedges. So the COMEX is a paper hedge to these longs. So to offset these unbacked paper spot gold liabilities. So in other words, what they were doing is the spot gold trade was being structured really just like any other foreign exchange trade, uh, which could be dollar, it could be dollar, dollar euro, it could be anything else. And they structure it in any way, uh, which in the same way as any other FX trade, which necessitates some form of hedge uh, to be implemented by market makers and the takers. So obviously you're trying to make a market, you're not trying to take a risk. But this is the key thing, unlike any other paper to paper phys uh, FX trade, which is what we just described, for the last 50 years, ever since the COMEX was formed to manage, and that is to dilute, a carefully balanced paper to physical dislocation between real supply and demand, these long spot gold credit positions have always posed a risk to these liquidity providers, providing these leveraged gold credit positions, because that's purely what they're providing, not physical gold credit positions, in so much as they could be called on for physical delivery. Fear the worst that this may happen. And that's precisely what happened in March 2020, a shortage of physical caused by COVID refiner block lockdowns at that time, caused such a starvation of physical supply into strong safe haven physical demand that buyers turned on mass on these market making liquidity providers to demand T plus two delivery, i.e. I want uh, delivery. And so you, you put them on notice and you must receive delivery within two days, technically or default. So you don't want to see a default. So in other words, they were demanding, they all turned en masse and said, give us this physical then. You're long, so you must have it. Uh-uh, they didn't have it. And this exposed the paper to paper sham for what it really is. And for the first time in 50 years, it broke this exchange for physical COMEX EFP mechanism. Don't get confused by these ter these terms if, if you're new to it. This is just a simple exchange from, from, a, uh, from a futures contract into a more deliverable over-the-counter market, which is where really the volume is. And this by design mirrors this 10 times larger technically deliverable spot market. And of course, this has been the main tool to rig gold prices with these kind of smoke and mirrors um, tools. Now, while the first tier too big to fail agent banks were openly and officially bailed out from multi-billion dollar losses when this happened, the second tier and mostly Swiss and European bank, second tier banks, they were left to suck up the losses which resulted in them exiting this space, which was extremely profitable once upon, once upon a time. And they've exited for good. So again, this is interesting because that's removed 
this degree of liquidity. And the reason I see this as very relevant now is that for a different reason than COVID, the backwardations signal that the physical to paper disconnect is once again threatening to blow up this insider's EFP hedging tool and expose these liquidity providers to another run. And while the, the we looked last time at the COT report, which is the COMEX report showing the biggest positions. Oh, goodness me. It, in a picosecond world, it's delayed by three solid days. It's, a, it's, it's really just a rigged uh, mechanism. But as we said last time, this report, which gets published every Friday that re reflects what happened on a Tuesday, they cannot hide the fact that the house, the casino, the insiders, are laying off as much short exposure as possible on the speculators. In other words, getting the speculators to take the risk. However, there are, there are only so many chips that you can put into play before the scam becomes too obvious, even to the siloed COMEX you know, uh, speculators. Now, given that since January 22 of this year, uh, net stable funding ratio standards now force the remaining liquidity providers to have bullion to back up these over-the-counter gold credit positions. And that's, of course, as we've described before, net of what they can flywheel into this scam of the GLD ETF, you know, the, the, the ETF which is labeled GLD, uh, because that's not 100% Basel III compliant. And, and, and what the wholesale footprints evidence uh, this is clearly not a, a, a compliant. And it indicates that officials, though, are right now the ones putting, providing a put under the agent bank short sellers. Now, normally we've looked at a put under the stock market uh, that the, that the uh, Fed has provided. But in this case, it's quite clear that they're incentivizing short sellers to come in, take the risk, and just providing them some sort of protection at the moment from getting rinsed on the upside at the moment, that is. Andrew, it sounds a lot to me like there's some musical chairs happening there, uh, a game of musical chairs happening there at the uh, at your favorite casino. But, uh, you know, can you give us an update on these, uh, the petrol ruble? Now that has happened since the uh, escalation in uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, and, and how this accelerating, how is it accelerating the paper to physical balance. And this is the point where we say, look, we're not taking sides here, just questioning the narrative. Because when there's only one narrative, one you should always question it. Now, we're not, you know, obviously we feel sorry for all people caught up in conflicts, but this is a good question, Shane, um, given the attempts by officials to incentivize specs to add paper market supply, essentially. And, and especially as this new dynamic has come into play, which you just mentioned. now. With the Russia-China Physical Gold Alliance, and it is an alliance, now openly facing, and let me just put that into words what that is, capitalizing on this wall of undeliverable paper market selling, it, is now ex it now exponentially ramps up the odds of another EFP blow-up. Failure. This became blatantly obvious last week and has carried through into this week as backwardated EFPs have once again expanded to actionable levels into this 100% paper-driven selling. Okay, who's taking the risk? Speculators, of course. Now, backwardated gold and, of course, silver uh, conditions are not going unnoticed by insiders because they're busy taking the long side of every momentum-driven spec short seller. But the real focus is on a massive unseen drawdown in global physical gold capitalizing on both paper-driven discount, but also hunting out every psyoped ounce, kilo, ton, put on offer for physical delivery outside the casino operator's world realm. Now, our focus is really on the small portion of the EFP'd COMEX gold flowing into the benchmark over-the-counter PM derivative fix. You know, we have a PM fix, have an AM fix, but that's primarily Indian bias. But the, the PM fix every single day at 3 p.m. UK time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 
is where the global price for gold is set. But it's a derivative fix. It is not a physical fix. And how outside this siloed 100% derivative fix, real physical demand is actually exponentially larger, but not seen. And as we highlighted last episode, the AM and PM fixes are, no, are now so unrepresentative of real physical supply demand fundamentals. So London is actually losing its status as the global gold market pricing hub. And that's realized by every wholesaler out there. Now, other than what must be contractually sold at market as the benchmark fix on behalf of producers, etc., no commercial, no central bank wants to sell any bullion at the rigged LBMA fixed price because it is a rigged price. And, and so they can get far higher. Um, uh, they, they, they would, if they were going to sell something, they will get far higher by laterally settled prices outside this CME LBMA fix. Now, obviously, there's always buyers and sellers in every market. And that's not to say there wouldn't be plenty of buyers at this price. But there's also sellers who want a fair price based on today's data. Now, this illusionary cartel controlled fix process has forced the cartel to retreat deeper into the increasingly divergent CME LBMA paper market world, now having to fall back to limiting just how much physical can be put on offer at this fix. And this ring fences the daily and monthly, and that includes the BIS settlements um, at the end of each month. It, 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 it sort of ring fences the, the squaring of deeply underwater derivative positions. This is all it's good for now. Now, the tiny amount of siloed physical that is put on offer is obviously snapped up by these insiders. I mean, this sleight of hand trick is sufficient to accommodate orders for loco London retail demand. So yes, you can go out and buy a coin or two, but large wholesale orders must be bilaterally settled outside the casino. So while the likes of China and Russia have been biding their time and quietly performing this paper to physical alchemy, which is really what the closest you can describe what they're doing, the Russian sanctions to answer your question, Shane, through the by the window, this by window, way wide open. And, you know, so really it's been stealthy up until now, but now it's accelerated. And the current official war narrative has hidden this game changer. And while officials have resorted to attack, this really is the only form of defense, but they've got zero physical to sell to swamp the market. So they have resorted to selling paper gold revealing just how weak a hand Western central banks have. So it's an illusion. So if you're siloed in the casino, you won't see this yet. Now, what I'm really trying to draw attention to here, right here and now, is that while very short term, this tidal wave of paper selling has driven the global, global price of US dollar benchmark gold lower, it's once again threatened to blow up the deeply backwardated EFB COMEX to over-the-counter mechanism. And it's, you can't ignore this stuff. And while insiders and liquidity providers, for that matter, realize the paper discount window is about to slam shut and are gearing up for it, this tectonic market shift has not yet been realized by these blinkered siloed spec traders now playing patsy to the insiders. Now, with Russia sucking out physical gold in size to meet uh, the the uh, discounted energy trade for demand, which is huge, paper to gold will need to paper gold will actually also need to rise to offset this insider facing delivery obligations. So, to answer your question, Shane, where do these lines cross? Short, medium, and longer term? Well, short term, the psyops war between the U.S. and Russia has ramped up, as you said, but this over the last five weeks particularly. And however, during this time, what is interesting, and we did touch this last time, but it's exponentially even more uh, pronounced, the, the, the ruble US dollar cross has risen to its strongest level against the dollar since 2018 to 2019. 
Now, this is a huge backfire for officials trying to contain this, its rise. And if you remember, Biden at the very beginning of this conflict called it rubble. Now, this is also offsetting their, um, their two-pronged efforts, the officials' two-pronged efforts to undermine the Russian, Russian central bank by discounting paper gold with unbacked dollar paper gold sales, which in turn is backfiring as it is ramping up energy-related physical buying. And there's no doubt that the US is targeting gold as part of these war efforts. And the current official intervention in gold is being financed by officials selling paper gold as a component of their Russia war effort. And this is going to backfire as significantly as their efforts to weaken the ruble have already backfired and continue to backfire, even though the, the Russian central bank has reduced capital controls. Now, given the wide open Russia-China gold hopper is busy converting every ounce of physical they can obtain uh, by way of utilizing the strong ruble, incentivizing the hugely attractive oil gold discount trade, the paper gold selling is, is just skating on such very thin ice. And the liquidity providers report unprecedented demand for every discounted ounce put on sale. Now, insiders exposed to the physical market know this, and they're taking the long side of every spec seller who has been successfully tricked into taking the short load, which explains recent, recent increases in open interest into this price decline. People have said, well, open interest is going up. The price is going down. Yes, yeah, specs are taking the load. Insiders are, are reducing the load. This leaves a large layer of attractive short cover above the market. When they are finished, then when you can't throw any more chips into the game, they will then start to rinse and take short cover on the upside because the specs are holding the bag. So really, just to sum it up, what we must expect, uh, medium and long term, we kind of looked at the short term, medium and long term, having failed to really rein uh, in the strengthening ruble over the last five weeks, the, phys the official PSYOP focus has now fallen back to desperate effort to limit how much physical is allowed to be offered for sale at this benchmarked LBMA PM derivative fix. However, while the war on gold is visibly being fought in the paper markets, outside this LCME LBMA casino alliance formed back in April 2020, following this March 2020 blow up, this was part of their rescue effort, the CM and the LBMA, two crooked organizations joined forces to basically, because they had to, um, what we're doing is we're experiencing very similar physical dislocation conditions to what originally blew up the EFP in March 2020, namely a global physical supply demand imbalance. Now, the state managed Russian commercial banks have been provided an unlimited Russian central bank bilaterally settled purchase order to buy physical gold in exchange for energy and commodities at a bilaterally settled price. And recognizing this, the official science war on gold has switched gears from failing attempts to openly intervene in the ruble FX cross to openly undermining the gold price using the only tool they have, which is selling paper gold. Now, the five week tidal wave of PSYOP paper market sales has done the intended job of reducing retail demand for gold and silver. And as is somewhat revealed in the last four weeks of the COT reports, which we kind of looked at last time, and I'm not going to waste your time looking at it again, specs are not just capitulating and hedging, but they're also speculating naked short. It's provable in those reports. This has laid the foundation for an underlying beach ball effect. And hiding this, retail demand is being balanced at the PM fixes to hide the large wholesale imbalances. Again, uh, fascinating, Andrew. I, I, you know, I always say that this is a fa you can't get this information anywhere else. And uh, Andrew, just before we started recording today, you highlighted a real interesting gold price benchmark. And I think this would really be of interest to all of our members. Can you run through these thoughts that you had, please? Yeah, and, and really, this is a great illustration as to how officially managed the dollar price of gold price is 
versus the dollar, the pound, the euro. I mean, pick any currency you want for that matter. And following 50 years of COMEX-driven paper market dilution in the real world, when we benchmark gold's purchasing power versus all these fiat currencies, we just have to look at that and say, let's pick the housing market. And this is, a sim this is similar when weighing up oil per ounce of gold or any other tangible for that matter. But it's the housing mar that market that touches most everyday people. But also, it's a valuation metric that drives the BRICS central banks to bolster their currency with deeply undervalued physical gold. So there is a relevance there. Now, looking at the hard data, and even when factoring in the last 50 years of officially sanctioned COMEX price suppression to water down this comparison, let's just look at, for example, the UK price data as a benchmark. Look, there's very similar com uh, comparisons in the US and most Western economies, but it's just something that is tangible and available and auditable. So in 1953, it took 150 ounces of gold to buy a house with an average nationwide determined price in, the, in 1953, it was 1,800 pounds. Now, 69 years later, in 2022, it only requires 180 ounces of gold to buy the same house with an assessed nationwide price of 275,000 pounds. Now, this equates to a gold inflation rate, including the dilution of the COMEX, of just 0.29% a year versus 20.29% inflation in the fiat currency terms. Now, it is this erosion of fiat purchasing power versus hard money that's not going unnoticed by global central banks busy converting Western diluted paper gold into physical gold. What a good hedge. And if gold was priced correctly, if we used historical valuation metrics, gold collateralization of US foreign obligations has reached historic lows. We've looked at this before. And the current ratio of gold to foreign debts is around 6%. The ratio is so far under the 20 to 40% historical average, which with the BIS, and if you, if, if, with the BIS likely expects this ratio to ultimately revert to following the information, the full implementation of Basel III as we move into 2023, restoring this 20 to 40% ratio of gold to foreign debts outstanding from current levels easily puts gold somewhere minimum six to $12,000 per ounce. Now, even if we took the lower band of 6,000, it would take less than 50 ounces of gold to buy the same house, which in 1953 cost 150 ounces of gold. I mean, the question is, okay, so where does that put silver? The gold silver cross is unbelievable. I mean, when you look at it and you say 84 to 1, after it's been 120 to 1, 84 to 1, it was 85 to 1, 86 to 1 the other day. But even if we, if we take that at face value and we don't adjust that, that puts silver somewhere between 70 and 140 bucks right now. Well, if we were looking, uh, I mean, essentially, if we then were to look at the historical average of 16 to 1, I mean, where would you even, you can pick a number as to where that puts silver, but certainly somewhere in maybe the two, 375 to $500 range. I think people can just pick a number, to be honest. Andrew, that, that's amazing. I know that I'm not speaking for myself here, but I got to ask you this question because we've got a lot of silver fans. We've got a lot of silver stackers and accumulators that watch this show every single time. It comes out. Can you just talk about what is going on with silver? Shane, I always know the silver question is coming. <laughs> and I know the big smile that I see on your face for every, even when we, when we, I mean, I know you've got silver all around you. Usually at this point, you pick up silver coins around you because you just love them being around you. But <laughs> it's, well, I, I think, yeah, while the larger gold market, it's important to understand that while the larger gold market is, undoubtedly the focus of this war. The smaller silver market is easy, easy to read and it really acts as a really fair proxy as to what these same actors are doing in gold. In fact, while officials are not assessed to have any skin in the silver game, actually, in fact, they do. Um, in so much as the two big to fail banks 
are holding substantial naked short over-the-counter silver derivative bets, which if you want to identify them, they're in the quarterly OCC Office of the Comptroller Report. Uh, so that's right there and then. And even if you discount, uh, you know, the 20% that's palladium, platinum, I mean, you're still talking, it's a multi-billion dollar bet. And these accrued multi-billion dollar over-the-counter derivative bets have recently been exposed to the Russian commodity market blowback and throwing their long-standing undeliverable bets into the crosshairs for potential physical delivery. And at best assessment, these short silver bets, which have accrued over time, have a break-even point of about 23 bucks an ounce. But as we discussed in a re recent um, liquidity provider meeting, asking the quest this question, would the bearish derivative bets have been instigated following the March Russian sanction blowbacks, drastically tightened available supply, backing up these bets, clearly the answer would be no, resounding no, and all commodity prices will rise. And due to 50 years of siloed COMEX price suppression, silver, as we know, is the most undervalued commodity on this planet Earth, bar none. And the nickel blow-up triggered the exil, exit of JP Morgan, and others making markets in base metals. But as we reported back four episodes ago, back in March, we've got direct first year bank information that these banks also want to square up and receive back their silver lease positions before silver does go nickel. Now, that's, you're seeing a panic to do that. And we're not the only wholesale participant that assesses that the CME bailout of the 10 times larger than related COMEX over the counter derivative bets on the 18th of April. This was a coordinated official bailout of, of both the lessors and the lessees of this multi-billion dollar derivative position, which had once again crossed the Rubicon line, which we talk about consistently, which is 26,225. That is the line where these, these, these bets blow up. And in reality, the uh, we've seen the, connect, the, the desperate attempts to do this. They've connected the ES and SI algos. They've captured SI, uh, the silver futures, that is. Uh, this ridiculous algo. There should no, there's no place for this algo to be in place. But you get enough people that believe in it, and the HFTs control it, and all the smaller algos join in. And again, you've got a, a connection. And we, as we discussed in our last episode, this is coordinated with the rescue of this multi-billion dollar over-the-counter OCC naked short too big to fail bank bet that was implemented on April the 18th by way of an unprecedented, now this is the CME bailout, this is an unprecedented officially sanctioned um, bailout. Where in a million years have you ever in the history of of, of the COMEX or the CME seen a margin reduction into a price rise. I mean, that's ludicrous. That is ludicrous. And it's so blatantly, obviously, uh, officially sanctioned. And obviously this was put in to rescue the too big to fail silver actors from the break point of these multi-billion dollar underwater bets at 26, two to five. In fact, it had just gone beyond that level. And suddenly the CME margin reductions come in, i.e., uh, uh, providing uh, providing credit to the shorts. Now, the extent of short covering afforded by this rig sell-off is opaque and pretty much, look, it's yet unknown, but a general assessment of by liquidity providers we've talked to say it is significant. And any remaining COMEX-related open interest is now solidly embedded and largely unflushable. So it's assessed that the level of selling that occurred below $23, this is their break-even point, is 100% spec short selling with these same insiders, one-to-one -one long against them, which now presents a very attractive additional short covering layers above the market into deeply technically oversold conditions. So you've kind of got the casino. Now, you know, they all run on a, on a 5 to 95% to ratio where the house wins 95% of the time but the house has got to win five, otherwise they run away. Well, you've reached that point. Comex sellers are still adding supply into this backward-aided condition. However, what's not yet evidence to Comex short sellers 
is that the historical COMEX silver relationship with this 10 times larger spot market became actionally inverted. Now, if you're a trader, you will know how important this is because whereas COMEX shorts traditionally hedge these over-the-counter longs, the spot longs that we talked about in gold, but it's the same in silver, they basically ran at around about a 17 to 20 cent contango, i.e. they traded about 17 to 20 cents above spot spot silver. So that provided a, a, a mechanism to actually play a game. Now into the sell-off last week though, below 22 and below 21, the oversell paper market condition inverted into a technical 10 cent spot premium to futures. Now think about it, that's, that's like 10 plus the, the 17 to 20, that is a major inversion. So what does this mean? It was the perfect setup for the house to lay the short liability off onto the blinkered specs as insiders could then hedge naked short COMEX positions in the 10 times larger spot over the counter market, inverting the entire trade. Now, good God, this is a bullish setup with insiders getting as net long as possible and the OCC short over the counter bets receiving a bailout to boot. This is so coordinated. Now the silver market, bottom line, it's broken in so much as price action in silver only represents derivative market action. However, even when discounting supply demand dislocations, remove them altogether. When a paper market is this technically oversold, just a dot on a screen, if there was no physical imbalance, forget that, the nature of any paper market is to retrace oversold technical conditions. And this brings the spec short stops placed above each of the full set of moving averages into the crosshairs. So with commodity markets tightening, liquidity providers assess that the next run at the Rubicon line likely succeeds. Have you got physical is my only question. Uh, now that sounds a little bit like someone I know that's awesome. Though well, there you have. Thank you so much, Andrew McGuire. Talking gold. And remember, buy physical and understand the difference between what Andy affectionately calls the casino paper gold and silver markets and the actual physical gold and silver markets. They're not the same. Don't be fooled. And there you have it. That's all we have for you today on another fascinating episode of Live from the Vault. Please help spread the word about this channel by liking, sharing, Hit that subscribe button. And if you click on that bell right there, if you want to be notified as these episodes go live. And with that, we'll see you next time on Live from the Vault. See you then.